Kia ora tata, everybody. Um, Bruce Arrell's my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. Um, welcome to this Thursday night webinar on COVID. We have 3,600 people registered for tonight, and, and this is obviously a really important topic for everybody. So thank you for taking the time out, and thank you to the speakers. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers, and they're going to talk about what we know in this early post Omicron stage, and we'll provide practical advice. Um, it'll include the Ministry of Health's view on response to long COVID. Uh, long COVID in children, is this an issue? Long COVID in adults, what services look like overseas? And what key components of services might be in New Zealand? Uh, the immunology of long COVID, what we actually know. Uh, COVID serology, clarity or confusion. Advice on getting back to exercise and physical activity post COVID. And then uh, wrapping up with long COVID and mental health. Um, so it's my great pleasure um, to welcome Martin Chadwick. He's the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer at the um, Ministry of Health, and he's going to talk about New Zealand's response to long COVID. Martin, over to you. Kia katoa, ko matuata toku tawaka, ko putuaki toku maunga, ko fakatani toku awa, ko nati awa te fanaapuni toku. Ko uh, iwi, ko Martin Chadwick uh, ahau, uh, ki taranga matu e noho ana, uh, ki au te Chief Allied Health Professions Officer, ki te manatu haora. So kia ora everyone, so uh, as Bruce said, I'm the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer at the Ministry of Health. So what I'd like to do is just to spend a little bit of time just talking through where we're at at a Ministry of Health. And certainly over this entire COVID period, that has been an overriding concern of mine and of my colleagues as we start to look at not so much the bow wave of the Omicron infections that we see now or the COVID infections that we see now, but more the, the sense of what is the stern wake going to be if we use the boating analogy. Just thinking that we are going to have a large number of people who are going to be dealing with potentially ongoing symptoms with regards to being infected with COVID. Now, if we were to have this conversation six to eight months ago, I think it would be a very different conversation that we'd be talking about the impact of Delta, we'd be talking about the impact on the lungs itself, the interstitial lung disease or damage which is done there, what that means around pulmonary function. But I think we need to take it into the context that within New Zealand, our outbreak is predominantly going to be of the Omicron variant. And what is the long term event or the long term effect of that is very much something which is a to be determined. Uh, quite simply, we don't know. Uh, we're given some very good indicators with regards to what has happened to the previous variants. And so that is what we can base some of our assumptions on. But I think we are going to be quite unique as a cohort, as a population, when we start to look what, what happens in the months ahead, that it is very much going to be around what happens with the Omicron variant. However, uh, that does not stop us from wanting to do some preparation for that. And so that very much was my concern. Uh, and so I raised that with Dr. Ashley Bloomfield and as uh, an agreement with the approach that we're going to be taking and looking at Omicron. So with regards to our approach, I think there are some very key um, principles that we're trying to adhere to. And I think the first and foremost is to give effect to our obligations under Te Tiriti o Waitangi uh, and very much including the interests and the needs of Māori. Ensuring equity, which involves inclusiveness for all communities, protect especially those most affected by COVID outbreaks, uh, e.g. Māori and Pacifica, and ensuring equity of access. And so I'm just going to pause there for a moment because that is where we really need to be focusing all of our efforts. And so I think anything we look at designing, anything that we want to put out in guidance, uh, I would put to us all that it needs to be viewed through the lens of equity in so far as that we know for a fact that it is our Māori population and our Pacific people population that have been adversely affected. So when we look at a design of what we need to be doing to approach that, I think it needs to always be taken into account that how is it going to be best effective for Māori and best effective for Pacific peoples. So key principle there, and then within that, looking at services that are effective, timely, and reflects back practice as the evidence emerges. Ensuring services are patient-centered, including patient self-management and digital enablement to support patients with long COVID. 
And certainly that last bullet point, when we look at other jurisdictions, what we are seeing uh, unfolding, what has been developed uh, certainly in the UK, uh, in Australia, in the US, that is a very, very high reliant on some of the self-service type activities. And so how we can start to look at that and what that needs to be in place for an Aotearoa New Zealand context, because uh, again, it needs to be placed in our context and again, needs to be placed in the construct of those that have been most affected by COVID and long COVID, which again, in all likelihood is going to be our Māori and Pacific people communities. And so very simply, and what we're trying to do is to ensure that we place the emphasis that long COVID will be a long-term condition. And so it is very much around how we focus on what is the symptomology. Some of the current definitions that are sitting out there, we know that for acute COVID that you're looking at uh, symptoms lasting up for up to two weeks. When you start to get beyond that six week mark, that's when we need to be considering the impact of long COVID. And I think the key thing here is around the symptomology and there are going to be some far wiser heads than I that are going to speak today around some of the potential etiology of what may be going on. But I think what I'd put to you, especially when we look at the Omicron, that that's very much an emergent science. And so when it comes to some of the more specific diagnosis and therefore some of the more uh, specific uh, therapeutics, I think that will emerge over time. But at this point, it's very much about how can we focus on the symptomology that is present and how we take that within the context of uh, longer term conditions and how we need to be wrapping our support around that. So four key approaches that we'll be looking at doing. Uh, the first is acknowledging that we do have some DHBs that have already started to walk down the road of what does a specific service need to look like. Uh, and again, I know Dr. Robin Whitaker is going to talk about that a little bit later about some of the work that Wairamata has looked at, what they've learned from other jurisdictions, what that could look like uh, within their particular uh, locale. So what do services need to look like, again, with an Aotearoa New Zealand context, but how can we start to take some of the key learnings that uh, Wairamata has been through and Waikato is another DHV that's looking at a similar service. What are those lessons and how can we start to package those up so if there is a desire to set up specific services in other areas is that we can hand over a change package or we can hand over some key learnings that will be useful in how they are going to be implemented in other areas. Uh, the second is around the evidence and uh, for yeah I think for all of us, it's it's an intriguing time because the evidence is in every way emerging. And so we've done already two very conclusive uh, literature reviews, but I feel like uh, three months is a long time. And so what we're wanting to do is to continue to do very exhaustive, both uh, hard and soft literature, if you will, to make sure that we are getting a real currency as to what is emerging within the peer reviewed literature, but also get a sense of what is emerging through the professional associations, societies and bodies internationally with regards to guidance. And then from that, start to package that and start to look at what are some of the guidance that we can put together for Aotearoa New Zealand. Again, within that sense that it needs to be contextualized. Again, putting that uh, lens of equity over it, which then behooves us to start to look at how we make sure that it is focused on our Māori and our Pacific peoples. What we want to do is to make sure that anything that we are doing is vetted in some ways. And so we are in the process of putting together an expert advisory group. We're trying to be very, very purposeful in how we do that. And so far as that we do want to try to, as much as we can, enact some of the tatiriti principles and try to get a good 50-50 mix, if you will, of the EAG to make sure we are reflecting that making sure we are getting the research uh, aspect into that, but also making sure we're getting some of the deliveries of the DHB aspects into that, but making sure we've got the voice of people with lived experience as well. So we are identifying people who are of Maori descent or Pacific Island descent, who've got lived experience of long COVID to make sure that they will be a part of the expert advisory group. And so they can be there to be part of that vetting process. So we can ensure that any guidance that we are developing that it is going to be appropriate for the communities that it needs to reach and the people working within those uh, communities. 
Further research is another key key point there. Uh, there will be gaps uh, simply as we start to look at what is emerging internationally, what we're seeing in the way of guidance from other jurisdictions. It will highlight that there is simply going to be some lack of research in particular areas which are reflective again of the uniqueness of New Zealand with the fact that Omicron being the dominant variant. And so that uh, gives us, uh, I guess, a real focus as to what we can start to engage with our research partners to start to look at what we need that is going to be particular, again, to Aotearoa New Zealand, so we can be sure that we are designing what we need to design for our people, um, that it's not going to be simply a transplant because a cut, and I think we've got enough experience to know that that doesn't always work the best. So to be able to give some good guidance and instruction there. So if you will, just to try to summarize it, it really is about how we do the learning by doing and so in knowing that there are already some areas that are working and putting services in place. So how can we work with them and understand what they've had to do to get those services going, uh, understand some of the barriers that they have to overcome, some of the ways they did get around those barriers and so how that can be learnt and how we can help others to do the same. The learning by looking is ensuring that we are looking very, very carefully uh, internationally as to what is going on and what is emerging. Uh, again, I would imagine we will in time learn more about the etiology. And I think within that, it allows us to have a focus on what is well known around post-viral fatigue type syndromes as well. And starting to look at how we can delineate that which is particular to COVID and then that which falls more within the basket of what we do see after the post-viral fatigue. I think there's a quiet irony that it's going to allow us to have a lot more focus on that population that are dealing with the ongoing effects of post-viral fatigue and the like. And hopefully over time we'll learn more about the actual etiology of itself. But that learning by looking hopefully will allow us to really delineate some of that particularness, if you will, that comes from the COVID infection itself, as opposed to that which is more of the post viral. So there is hope that there may actually be some unintended benefits as we walk down this road to be able to help other populations. And then funneling all of that through the expert advisory group to ensure that it is appropriate for the communities that we need it to be. And I think within all of this, uh, it comes down to, and we're all familiar with delivering healthcare, that there is an opportunity cost. And so how we see this within the broad spectra of the services that we need to be providing. And so while COVID has got a very clear spotlight on it at the moment, and we need to ensure that we are designing, delivering services that are needed for the communities and are tailored for the communities, it does need to be done in a way that we look at the entirety of services that need to be delivered and just ensure that we are not necessarily taking from other services that are just as needy. So there's always the need to try to balance that up. And so where we are as of today, so we are actively putting the expert advisory group together. We have, uh, we've had a plethora of names that have come forward of people who are willing or have been put forward to be a part of that. Uh, so we hope to within the next week or two to go out and start to do some invites for people to be a part of that. As I've mentioned, we've done uh, two very comprehensive uh, literature reviews. We will do another within the next month to make sure that we are ensuring uh, currency. And we've also done a review of other jurisdictions, professional bodies and the like to make sure that we are getting a real sense of what has been put out there. Uh, we will aim to have the first meeting of the expert advisory group within the next three to four weeks. And what we want to do is to ensure that we can onboard people in a right way to give them the fullness of understanding of what is there as far as an understanding from a literature, literature perspective, what is there from an understanding of designing a service perspective to then be able to place that within our context. Uh, certainly within the next two months, we would look to have some of the first guidance uh, that we'll be putting out to the sector. Uh, but ideally, we will be doing uh, quite regular updates to the sector more broadly, just so that we can be sure that we're keeping people appraised of where we're at and how we're progressing. So I'll kind of end this uh, with how I started, uh, with that whole sense of the bow wave is now, but it is about the stern wake and how, about how, we, how we are trying to place ourselves to deal with that in time. So I will stop and Bruce, hand back to you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Okay, so our next speaker is Professor Peter McIntyre, uh, University of Otago, also Honorary Professor at the University of Auckland.
He's going to talk about long COVID and children. Is this an issue? Peter. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, kia ora, uh, everyone. Um, uh, as Martin said, I think New Zealand is in a uh, fortunate situation, um, having uh, not having had to deal with the, uh, the tsunami of COVID that other parts of the world have been um, dealing with um, over the past several years. So, uh, but as far as long COVID is concerned in children, it is a source of a lot of uh, anxiety. And uh, the things that I would like to just touch on in the short lead-in period we've got this evening is um, looking at the burden of COVID-19 going from Delta to Omicron in children, which I think is, is different. And I think we need to look at it from more of the perspective of a, 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 a zero COVID environment coming into COVID rather than the sorts of scenarios we've seen in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but importantly, with respect to long COVID, um, the big question, I guess, is how big a problem is it? And I'll try to give you some very recent data to inform our thinking about that, and then hopefully end up on an optimistic note in terms of uh, prevention. So um, how severe is COVID? I mean, something which is a theme, I think, um, worth bearing in mind both for COVID in general, but also particularly for long COVID and particularly in children, is the use of control data. And there's a recent uh, nice uh, short report from the US where they compared five to 11 year olds uh, looking at hospitalizations for COVID, but can benchmarking that against influenza and RSV. And what they what they demonstrated was that, in fact, the, uh, the number of hospitalizations for influenza and RSV in this age group were substantially more than those for COVID. But uh, the unique thing about COVID was the multi-system inflammatory illness called MISC or PIMs, which really wasn't seen with these other respiratory viruses. And in fact, looking at the data across these US hospitals, although um, MISC was only a very small proportion of uh, overall COVID. In fact, the hospitalizations due to this were similar in number to in all other hospitalizations due to COVID. Um, and uh, I think this in a sense is the, the pediatric equivalent of the adult scenario of what happens with long COVID in terms of severe illness versus uh, less severe illness in the community. And this is a, a graphic just uh, I guess, indicating the comparative severity um, on most recent data for PIMS MISC here versus COVID in children. Um, all these severe sequelae are uncommon, but as you can see, um, uh, MISC-C much more likely to re require intensive care support and, and potentially have longer term sequelae. And this is the most recent data, which I think because the numbers are much larger is worth looking at um, from Sydney. Um, and in um, about 5,100 uh, hospitalizations during the Delta wave that they saw there, um, most of the hospitalizations for COVID were in fact not related to COVID itself, but related to various family support issues. Um, and in particular, intensive care requirement due to uh, COVID itself was less than one in a thousand, and and in contrast to the US, the uh, the MISC C uh, incidence during Delta was one at about two thousand five hundred. So only a couple of cases out of all these five to eleven year olds hospitalised, um, and in particular, they uh, identified that children who already had other health problems were uh, more likely to be hospitalized. No increase with asthma, but there, uh, there were substantial increases in children with other respiratory problems or neurologic uh, disorders. Um, and importantly, though, of course, uh, because these children are small in number, in fact, most of the hospitalizations looking at those just due to COVID were in children who have been previously well. Um, and uh, as as been seen in New Zealand, as Omicron has swept through uh, 
in uh, in Australia, um, there have been more hospitalizations because there are more cases, even though the proportion hospitalized with Omicron has been lower. And, and this is the most recent data from an Australian pediatric hospital network, which was able to report up to the end of February uh, uh, with ICU uh, requirement and hospitalization for MISC cases uh, shown here. And you can see that um, in the early Omicron period, clearly uh, MISC has gone up. So this is something um, to just bear in mind as a part of that more severe end of the pediatric spectrum. So what about long COVID in general? And in particular, um, this question of, you know, kids who seem to have, you know, not terribly severe symptoms initially, what happens to them? And uh, there's a very nice resource, which has just been put up by, uh, by Kids Health uh, in fact, today, um, which has some very useful uh, background information on long COVID in children and some links to other resources. So I would encourage you all to have a look at that. Um, but there was a study uh, at the end of last year, which uh, looked at the data about long COVID in children, um, uh, about five studies that they examined. Um, and when they focused on the studies that actually had control data, um, you know, looking at children with some other respiratory infection and comparing those with uh, children with documented COVID, um, you can see that although there was an increase in um, persisting symptoms in the children with COVID, when you compared them with controls, um, those differences were in absolute terms are quite small um, in the order of a few percent. Whereas if you looked at the absolute rate of uh, presentation with symptoms just in the COVID cases, you would get a very different impression. And this is the most recent data. It's only in adolescents, not in younger children from the clock study uh, in the UK, which uh, was able to compare something like 3000 children with uh, PCR positive COVID with um, 3,000 children with negative tests, um, only a 13% response rate, but the participation was similar between the test positive and test negatives. And interestingly, at the time of the positive test, so at initial presentation, as you'd expect, um, many more of the PCR positive children had um, at least one symptom than the negative children. But at three months down the track, in fact, um, both the proportion reporting at least one symptom was a lot higher but it was a lot higher in the test negative and the test positive children. Um, and when they uh, focused on those who had at least three symptoms, um, it was about double in the test positive children, but still quite a bit of a different picture to what was seen at initial presentation. And I think this partly reflects just everything that was going on in the UK for children at that time. Um, and uh, significantly in that regard, in terms of self-report, of being worried, sad, sad or unhappy, the proportion reporting those feelings in the test positive and test negative group was about the same. Um, and what this team did was focus in on um, a, a multi-symptom group, um, which was clearly different in amongst the, the test negative and test positive, um, with uh, about 30% of the test positive and uh, just under 20% of the test negative. So a 50% uh, increase in the likelihood of reporting of, of being in this multiple symptom group um, out of three months. Um, and this group were more likely to be female, more likely to be in the older adolescent age group and more likely to have had poorer health prior to infection. Um, and, and, and this is um, very similar to um, some other surveys which have been done in, uh, in Denmark. Now, this data from Norway um, is informative because it not only looks at uh, adolescents, but also at younger and older children. Um, and because of the Norwegian health data system, which is not too dissimilar to the New Zealand one, um, they were able to look at all healthcare use um, comparing uh, children who tested positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 with those who were negative, uh, and even actually look at a group um, who were untested, but of course their status was unknown. Um, and so they compared here the, 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 the uh, likelihood of both primary and specialist care um, prior to the positive PCR, 
and not surprisingly showed a big increase in health service use early on, which did take quite a while to come back to baseline. In the, interestingly enough, in this study, in the, in the older children, in fact, they'd come back to baseline by, uh, by six months. The younger children under five hadn't quite come back to baseline and they uh, thought that that was due to the occurrence of, uh, of respiratory uh, problems early on, which were persisting to some extent. And of course, given the high burden of respiratory disease, particularly in, in Maori and Pacific children, this is something to be aware of in the, uh, in the New Zealand context. Um, the good news, just to finish off with, is that th there is um, very encouraging evidence that um, for children as well as for, um, for adults that vaccines are important in prevention of, of both uh, MISC and probably long COVID. Um, there's US data showing that infections in general reduced by about 30% even during Omicron. Um, and if you look at the next level of severity, emergency department presentations, as opposed to primary care reduced by about 50%. Um, and perhaps most importantly, but only uh, applying to adolescents, uh, an almost 95% reduction in uh, uh, multi-system inflammation or ICU requirement um, in adolescents, even those who'd received one dose. So um, all looking um, very positive, but also emphasizing, you know, just, just how important it is to continue um, both in the five to 11 year olds, as well as the adolescents to emphasize the importance of vaccination. So in summary, um, the data we have to, so far suggests that long COVID is less common in children and young people, and in particular, less common in younger children and in younger adolescents than in the older adolescent group, that symptoms do approve over time, but there's a significant tail to that, um, and particularly with the most severe group um, and focusing on that multi-inflammation group, um, uh, the likelihood of prolonged symptoms is greater. Um, but importantly, that even one dose, um, and we assume uh, even better with two doses, um, seem to be highly effective. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. You've got some great data there. So just want to welcome our next speaker. It's uh, Dr. Robin uh, Whitaker. She's an Associate Professor at the University of Auckland and Clinical Director of Innovation Institute for Innovation and Improvement at Wider Matter DHB, and she's going to talk about long COVID and adults. Over to you, Robin. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Robin Whitaker, toko ingo. Um, I'm really going to talk about um, long COVID services in particular. Uh, so, um, and this quote on the side there is uh, from one of our participants in some of our um, consumer research who was asked, what would they have liked the doctor to say to them uh, that would have helped them? So uh, this is really pointing to the fact that this is all very still, still very uncertain territory. Um, so I work for uh, Waitemata District Health Board and also for the National Institute for Health Innovation at the University of Auckland. And about 18 months ago, uh, I started having an interest in long COVID and told the ministry that we should really be following up every patient with COVID in New Zealand. We had a unique opportunity to see what was going on with the long-term impacts on people's lives from COVID. And they agreed with me and then they gave that study to someone else. So here I am plugging someone else's study. Uh, but this um, study being run by Victoria University is still looking for recruits uh, for people who have had COVID, particularly in the Delta wave, and they are following them up. So I do encourage people to sign up. But while we were preparing for that study, we started doing regular updates of all of the published literature around long COVID and decided that we needed to make that publicly available. So uh, this is the NIHI website. Uh, it has a long COVID page, one for uh, the public and one for health professionals. We try to update it um, frequently. We're starting to struggle because there is starting to be a huge amount published now, uh, but you will find a review of the current literature there and lots of links to other sites and lots of references there that may be helpful. Uh, so we shifted from having a focus on the research to having a focus on establishing a long COVID service, hopefully a Waitemata DHB soon. Uh, and uh, we looked at what did long COVID services look like overseas? How were they being run? Uh, and what could we learn from that? And uh, we had a wonderful summer student, Felicity O, who collected all that data for us. And the result has been this uh, paper published in Public Health Expert blog, 
uh, so you can read more about it there, but I'm quickly going to tell you about some of the findings. <clears throat> so the international long COVID services that we found uh, information about are predominantly from the UK, uh, also US, uh, European countries and Canada. Uh, they vary quite significantly and some of them were built into existing services, some of them being completely new services. And they came into these kind of three buckets of being uh, some being primary care based, uh, where uh, uh, a lot of the support and the therapy uh, was being able to be provided in the community with referrals to specialist services as needed. Um, the vast majority were actually kind of hospital run or initiated one-stop shop type clinics, bringing in multidisciplinary team and then bringing in specialists as needed as well. So the types of um, clinicians that were running those services tended to be respiratory physicians, uh, allied health, uh, physios, OTs, psychologists, speech language therapists, social workers, dietitians, and then bringing in other specialists as needed, such as cardiology, ORL, infectious diseases, neurology, renal medicine, rheumatology, uh, psychiatry and immunology. And then there's a third group that were really very just rehab focused and were run entirely by allied health. Uh, they have varied eligibility criteria, but mostly starting around the 10 to 12 weeks since their COVID infection. Uh, so the, the official kind of definition at the moment is from four to, tw can be from four to 12 weeks post COVID, but most of the services are starting at that uh, kind of 10 to 12 week. We know that it's a bit of a continuum from acute COVID to post-acute. Some people are still suffering quite a lot in that um, you know, four to 12 week area, but then long COVID seems to be something else again that starts much later and is much more multi-system, multi-organ. Uh, and that's what most of these services are targeted at. Because uh, if someone has uh, uh, post-hospital effects or post-intensive care or uh, respiratory damage from the illness, then uh, those, those kind of people are already being followed up with usual hospital services. But these long COVID services are really focused on people, a lot of whom were not hospitalized or uh, didn't have that severe an illness, but they're really having these uh, new set of multi-system or multi-organ unexplained symptoms uh, that you will have all have heard a lot about, you know, a lot of fatigue, a lot of um, difficulty concentrating, sleep issues, uh, aches and pains, and then uh, getting a lot more severe than that as well. So a lot of these symptoms, uh, these services have developed new screening tools and functional status questionnaires that are very specific to COVID. Uh, and we're looking through those and picking out ones that, that we can use. A lot of the services have also been based on just a few sets of guidelines from around the world, particularly the NICE guidelines in the UK, the NHI or CDC guidelines from the US, and some uh, international rehab guidelines as well from some of the big uh, professional societies. Unfortunately, there's been little published um, outcomes and evidence of impact from these types of services. Uh, we have seen a couple of papers uh, but as yet, it's still to come, but there are certainly being published some measure sets to use. So from all of this work, um, from looking at what was happening overseas, what has been published, from talking to quite a lot of services overseas, we actually got hold of quite a few people who are running these services, and then also from talking a lot with people who have suffered from long COVID. So uh, we have joined up forces with the long COVID, um, long haulers, Facebook peer support group. We've had uh, a lot of support there from Janine Crossan and others on that group. Uh, and we're also doing some research now where we're um, talking with people about their experience with COVID as well. So with, from all of that information and in that uh, paper, we have put together what we think are some of the key components for long COVID services. Uh, and then I'll give you a bit of an, an Altera NZ flavor on that as well. But these are the key components. Uh, it's been really important to provide up-to-date information and uh, education for population, for patients and their whanau, and for health professionals, so that everyone is really on the same page there. Uh, we really need a standardized definition for a diagnosis. And what we've heard a lot from people is what they really want is to have their experiences acknowledged, to have it validated that they have an illness and they're having this, this um, set of, of really quite severe impacts on their lives. And so that very first contact with people is really important to acknowledge that and if possible to give them that kind of diagnosis. Uh, the 
it, there's an initial assessment of their particular symptoms. And it, as I've said, it's such a continuum. It's really varied uh, and uh, it can affect people in so many different ways. But we also need to understand what are their concerns and what are their needs for ongoing care. So we've seen a lot from the services internationally that we need to be trying to provide the right level of care for people. And that, that is also quite, um, quite varied for people. Uh, people in general are finding quite a lot of help from self-management support resources. So we've been developing some of these at the moment uh, to make available online. Uh, and some people are finding that with that acknowledgement of what's going on for them and with an understanding of their symptoms and some self-management support around how to manage their fatigue and their brain fog, uh, they are able to cope. Uh, but uh, some are way more severe than that, obviously, and that's when the multidisciplinary team support and individualized care plans are really necessary to help support those people. And then the appropriate referrals through to specialists to really uh, do some of those specialist investigations to work out that there's what is really going on, particularly um, with things like um, the myocarditis, acute kidney injury, uh, and various other things that people are suffering from. Uh, patient and peer support networks have been really important uh, internationally and in New Zealand, and also being able to provide this kind of service in a remote way. So really using telehealth uh, to provide the service because people are way too fatigued to actually come in and uh, have all of these uh, investigations necessarily in our service. So particularly if they're needing um, you know, a very multidisciplinary team, we need to take that team to them rather than them coming in to see us. So just some of those critical aspects and um, some of these have already been mentioned, so just really briefly, but that having a real patient-centered approach. So as I've said, we build this service in, around an individual care plan around that person and what they need. Uh, a co-design approach that we're taking by, by including lots of people with lived experience in the design of our service. Equity focus has been um, brought up. There's you know, lots of really um, important subgroups within this cohort that we really need to think about. Um, and we've already said it's a continuum from acute COVID. The acute COVID response, we've had a very multidisciplinary, multi-organizational, multi-sectoral response, and we really need to continue that through into long COVID and build on that um, relationship that we've really worked on. Uh, research really needs to be embedded in this. There's so much we don't know. Uh, there's so much uncertainty, and particularly around what is the New Zealand response, what is the New Zealand um, experience of long COVID? We know very, very little at the moment. And so we really need to be building research into these services. And because of that uncertainty as well, we need to be building services that are gonna be responsive and able to adapt and be flexible uh, to all the things that we don't yet know. Uh, so just like to acknowledge the rest of the team who worked on this. Thanks very much, Bruce. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. I think, uh primary care are going to appreciate having uh, these services available. And I think uh, very grateful for what you've been doing to prepare the way for that. Um, our next speaker is Miriam Hurst, clinical immunologist, uh, Auckland Hospital, is gonna talk about the immunology of long COVID, what we actually know. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, about the immunobiology of long COVID and what we actually know. Um, as other speakers have mentioned, the, one of the problems in this area is that this is a moving target that we're trying to track. So data that we have uh, for patients who've been affected primarily with Delta uh, may not be relevant to patients who develop Omicron. Data derived from populations with a high baseline rate of infection may be less relevant to the New Zealand population, which have a low baseline rate of infection. Um, but what I wanted to talk about tonight were some of the theories that are currently in the literature uh, about the etiology behind long COVID and what might be happening to cause um, these symptoms for patients. Um, and these are not intended to be, these theories are not mutually exclusive. Uh, it may be that patients have some degree of any or all of these. Uh, it may be that there are subgroups of patients in whom one um, etiology is more important than others. Um, it may be that it depends on the strain of the virus or, or other factors. But these are kind of the four main theories in the literature. Um, the first being the presence of persistent virus or viral antigens driving chronic inflammation. Uh, the second being autoimmunity triggered by the infection. Uh, the third looks at other organisms, so it's looking at dysbiosis, um, at changes in the microbiome, 
or reactivation of viruses other than COVID in the context of COVID infection. Uh, and the fourth group is looking at unrepaired tissue damage from the original infection. And also I would put um, endothelial dysfunction there, which is certainly a concern as a possible etiology for long COVID. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the evidence that we have for these. Uh, so starting with the persistent virus and viral antigens, we know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral antigens can be found in tissue for months after acute infection. Uh, in studies that have looked at patients with persistent symptoms to see if they still have the presence of virus, there is a small study looking at 29 patients who had symptoms at least four weeks after acute infection and found 14 of those still had detectable levels of virus in plasma. Uh, and four of those were still having positive results in plasma greater than at 70 days or more post their acute infection. Uh, so we know that there can be viral antigens persisting. Um, in terms of looking at the chronic inflammation, uh, there's quite a lot of work going on looking at things like cellular activation, um, at uh, what, you know, activation of B and T cell populations, uh, and production of cytokines, particularly looking at some of the inflammatory cytokines like the interleukins, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF. Uh, and this is an area where Dr. Anna Brooks, um, who's a cellular immunologist at the University of Auckland, is doing quite a bit of work looking at trying to establish these kind of signature profiles for patients with long COVID that may show a pattern of activation uh, in this setting. And this is similar to what has been done overseas with the aim of trying to identify whether there are particular um, fingerprints for long COVID, uh, whether there are subgroups for long COVID that may identify potential um, differing prognoses or identify possible therapeutic interventions. Um, so moving on to the autoimmunity setting. So we, we do find autoantibodies in patients with long COVID. Uh, and so one of the problems with autoantibodies when you find them is working out the significance of an autoantibody. So we need to know, is the autoantibody functional? Can it bind to a target? Uh, is it pathogenic? Because quite often in, in other diseases, the autoantibodies that we measure are not actually causing the disease. They're more of a bystander from damage that's being caused by some other part of the immune system. Um, so those are kind of key questions to answer. The, the sort of autoantibodies that have been identified in patients with long COVID have targets like anti-nuclear antigens, so similar to those seen in SLE. Um, there have been autoantibodies found targeting phospholipids, so thinking about the coagulation uh, cascade. Um, also other targets uh, such as B cells, T cells, cytokines, um, ACE2, so the receptor that SARS-CoV-2 uses to enter cells, um, and endothelins. Um, what is interesting in the autoimmunity space is that there seems to be a negative correlation between having autoantibodies and having antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 itself. So the better your body is at generating antibodies to the virus, the less likely you are to have autoantibodies detected. Uh, and one of the interesting questions that comes out of that is, are these autoantibodies triggered by the COVID or were they present before? Uh, and COVID has kind of unmasked a, a pre-existing problem. And there is some data. So what you can do, you can look at the isotype of the antibody and see is it IgM, the sort of initial antibody, or is it a mature class switched antibody like IgG? And certainly there is some data suggesting that these autoantibodies may be present prior to infection. Uh, we know that autoantibodies can precede disease by quite some months or years. And so this may be a, a possible way to identify patients at risk. Uh, although in terms of what we can offer in New Zealand, most of these autoantibodies are not currently available to be tested for. Um, looking at dysbiosis and viral reactivation. So there have been a number of studies looking at the microbiome, particularly oral sampling or fecal sampling, to look at what happens to the microbiome in patients with long COVID. Uh, and they've found that there's a decreased diversity of bacteria uh, in these patients and that there seem to be increased populations of pathogenic bacteria and decreased populations of beneficial bacteria. Um, in terms of viral reactivation, there is some quite interesting data looking at EBV reactivation in the context of COVID infection um, and whether that contributes towards uh, long COVID. There is also work being done looking at some of the other herpes viruses like CMV, HHV6 as well. Um, 
And so we've got a lot of information. Uh, and the question is, is what can we do? And obviously what we want to do is use that research and going forward to look at prevention and to, and to look at diagnosis and treatment. Um, and so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but I did actually want to talk about vaccines because that is something that's come up as a potential, both, as, both in terms of prevention uh, and in terms of treatment in the long COVID space. So obviously, in terms of prevention, if you don't get COVID, hopefully you, you, you shouldn't get long COVID. Um, <clears throat> but the question has been whether breakthrough infections, so people who get COVID despite being vaccinated, whether they're less likely to end up with long COVID. Uh, and there was some very encouraging data initially from the UK looking at the COVID app, which looks at about 1.2 million people uh, reporting their symptoms. And that found that people had had two doses of a COVID vaccine. And obviously in the UK, that could have been AstraZeneca, Pfizer or a combination. Uh, but they were about 50% less likely to report symptoms um, of long COVID than patients who are unvaccinated. Uh, there was a similar, slightly smaller study in the UK, this time looking at a control group that found an odds ratio between um, vaccinated and unvaccinated patients for long COVID of 0.59, so again showing a, a reduction. Um, there was, however, a study in the US which looked at about 10,000 people, and this was done on the basis of electronic health records, and that didn't find a significant difference between the vaccinated and unvaccinated populations uh, in terms of um, symptom, uh, recorded symptoms consistent with long COVID. Uh, and again, that, that used a control group as well. So uh, I think, part of, as, as I've said, and as other participants have said, part of the problem is that this is a moving target. Most of that data has come from Delta uh, and from earlier strains. And so we don't know going forward exactly how useful things will be. In terms of treating people with vaccines, again, this has been done in small studies. So there have been studies which have shown um, people to improve with dose, their long COVID symptoms to improve with a vaccine. One study found about 40% of people reported improvement, but 14% of people reported deterioration, which is obviously not what we, not what we want. Um, and another study found that about there was about a 13% sort of reduction in symptoms with the first dose of a vaccine and a further 9% with the second dose. Uh, but at the moment, there's no pathway in New Zealand for people to access additional doses of vaccine over and above what is um, in the current schedule. Um, so that is a, a very brief overview about some of the research in the space and some of the theories and hypotheses that have been established and some of the evidence for these. Uh, and I think it will be really useful going forward to have these to build on for the future. Um, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Miriam. Lots of um, research questions here by the looks. Next speaker is Dr. Tom Padsley, cardiologist, Auckland Hospital. Um, he's going to talk about post-COVID-19 and cardiac symptoms. Thanks very much for the invite to talk. I'm going to give a bit of a mismatch talk about COVID and the heart, including long COVID, COVID, and a bit about vaccinations. Just a brief summary of how COVID affects the heart specifically. We know that early on, the virus gets into the heart via these ACE2 receptors, and that's how it causes its myocarditis effect via cell mediated death. The second phase is the activation of the or the cytokines or the so-called cytokine storm, where you get activation of T cells, which directly affect the heart. You also get a lot of vascular permeability, and that's what leads to the pneumonitis in the chest. With all this active inflammation, there's a lot of um, inflammation of the arterial system. And that's what um, leads to patients getting strokes and myocardial infarctions. And the last part of the process is this autoimmune response with immunoglobulins and forms a lot of basis of what causes autoimmune myocarditis and also has a role in POTS, which I'll talk about later. Now, all these um, insults to the heart lead to an increase in cardiovascular disease. And patients with cardiovascular disease have this oscillating course where they get worse, then they get better, and most patients recover. However, those cardiovascular patients with other risk factors, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, often have a waxing, waning course. Adding to their woes is the, um, or adding to the process is the mental health impairment, inability to return to work, reduced exercise tolerance, and risk of obesity, 
all leading, leading to chronic conditions and chronic COVID. So what we are seeing in hospital, and I'm sure you guys are seeing a lot out in the community, is exacerbation of chronic cardiovascular conditions with COVID and also an increase in new cardiovascular conditions, as I've just mentioned. What we're also seeing is a very large subgroup of patients who present to us with atypical sounding chest pain and dyspnea post their COVID infection, and we can't find any obvious pathology. And that subgroup of patients is very hard to treat and manage. We've seen a large cohort of patients with POTS. We get a large number of questions about um, people wanting to know when they can return to exercise, when their children can re return to competitive sport. We're having ongoing issues with um, vaccine-related chest pain, myocarditis, pericarditis. And we're also seeing a large backlog of patients that we haven't been able to see over the last two years. Now, we know that long COVID uh, leads to a deterioration in the cardiovascular system. And there's been a lot of press recently, and this was um, put out there by one of my esteemed colleagues at Auckland. And this was based on a veteran study in America, which showed that over a year, there was a significant increase in the percentage of patients with heart failure, arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, and stroke post the COVID infection, you know, up to 50% increase in heart failure and arrhythmia specifically. However, in regards to this article published in Nature, this was largely based on a population that had been exposed to Delta and previous variants of COVID, not Omicron. They were largely unvaccinated at the time of infection, so it is hard to compare directly to our population. We know that in the UK, they've had a large number of patients with COVID, and they've seen that there's been an increase in up to four, um, a major increase in cardiovascular events after up to four months after diagnosis. So the question for our population really is given that we've predominantly been infected with the Omicron variant, which is known to be less severe, are we going to have the same effect on our cardiovascular disease long term? We also know that there's been an increased use of antivirals as they've been shown to be effective. And we have, we have higher vaccination rates at the time of our infection. And so this is an ongoing area of research. Now, patients in your practice, is, it's really about navigating the minefield. We're going to see a lot of exacerbation of chronic conditions as I've mentioned. And I don't need to talk to you guys. You guys know your patients far better than we do. And you'll know the ones that are at home at risk of deterioration, the patients with brittle heart failure, the patients that go into atrial fibrillation easily. These are the patients I guess you should, you'll be targeting and seeing earlier and reviewing at an earlier stage. There's also a ro role with patients post COVID who have a number of cardiovascular risk factors, especially the obese population, as we know that promotes inflammation and endothelial dysfunction. So even though this group may not have established cardiovascular risk or established cardiovascular disease, they may be a really good um, population to target for early and aggressive primary prevention. So I'm talking about statin therapy and aspirin if indicated. And if you're oscillating, if you're not sure, then I would suggest going early and hard with statins and aspirin, sorry. There's also a role maybe for anticoagulation earlier. If you've got a chads vas patient or a patient with atrial fibrillation who's got a chads vas score of one, and you're not sure whether or not you should anticoagulate or someone's got a higher chads vas score and they, they don't really want to go on anticoagulation, I think you can really push hard that going on anticoagulation post-COVID is going to be beneficial for them. And if everything um, is not going well out in the community, um, the hospitals can accommodate these patients and we're always happy to be ca called. And it's always better, I think, to get these patients in early if you're worried than to leave them out in the community. The group that we're really having a hard time dealing with. And I think what we're seeing in general practices as well, because we're getting a lot of referrals about these patients, are the patients that come to see you and see us with non-specific symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath and palpitations. And that is extremely prevalent in patients post COVID. Overseas, we're seeing it up to around about 15 to 20% of patients having at least one of these symptoms more than four weeks post their infection. It's really hard to give advice about what to do with these patients, but all I can suggest is that when we get our referrals and we're triaging at the hospital, we base all our decisions on history, as do you. And so it's really um, getting to the crux of the problem and trying to identify who are the patients who are most at risk? You know, are they, have they got cardiovascular risk factors? Are there red flags in the history? I, you know, are they presenting with shortness of breath with signs of congestion? And I guess the key is to keep rolling out alternative, alternative pathology 
knowing that some of these patients, the COVID is going to be the red herring. I appreciate from my last discussion at this meeting that getting an ECG can be really difficult. But if you can, it's common to see sinus tachycardia or sinus bradycardia in these patients. We get a lot of requests for halters, but they're unlikely to help. And studies overseas have shown that predominantly this shows sinus tachycardia and there's no treatment change or no change in outcome in those who got holders and those, didn't, those that didn't. A chest X-ray also, if you're in trouble. Uh, blood tests again, and the patients who have active COVID are difficult, but those in post-COVID, I always feel a troponin is so helpful to try and risk stratify these patients. A troponin elevation in the setting of an Omicron infection is very, very unlikely to represent myocarditis and is far more likely to re represent a deterioration in their cardiovascular status, i.e. heart failure unstable angina or acute coronary syndrome. And if in doubt, I really strongly advise you to ring the on-call cardiologist or the on-call physician at the local hospital and call the SMO directly. I think a lot of the time, if you talk to the registrar, their decision really is whether to admit or keep in the community and they'll have a lower threshold to admit. If you're sitting on the fence and you're not sure what to do with the patient, then give the SMO a call and at least share some of that responsibility for that patient. At the end of the day, with these patients with these non-specific symptoms, a lot of the time just reassurance that they will get better gradually, um, that there's been no major pathology found, and then aim for a graded resumption to exercise sounds was reasonable. And remembering if someone has myocarditis or pericarditis or a severe infection, i.e. has been hospitalized, then possibly a three-month stand down is appropriate. Now POTS, oh man. This is a tough subject. Um, so postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is really common post COVID. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what's driving it, but we're seeing it up to 31% of patients. It seems to be an autonomic dysfunction. And what seems to happen is the virus seems to dampen down the parasympathetic activity. And what happens is you tend to get a bit more sympathetic activity. So your heart's always got the handbrake down. And we see lots of palpitations, chest pain, and breathlessness. The great thing about POTS is that you can diagnose it in your practice. Get them to stand up if their blood pressure drops by more than 20 millimeters mercury after two to three minutes, or if their heart rate increases by more than 30 beats after 30 to 60 seconds, they've got an element of autonomic dysfunction. Again, I think the key thing for POTS and patients post-COVID is just to acknowledge they've actually got something going on a lot of time they may have, been seen other, may, may have been seen by other doctors. They're a bit despondent. There's a lack of acknowledgement that something's going on. Key other, thing, key other management strategies is to educate them about what's going on, encourage exercise if they can, drink plenty of fluid, salt, and wear those nice looking stockings if they can. Our key messages when we see them is the graded exercise rehabilitation. And we see an improvement in the exercise capacity and cognition at four months. If there's ongoing palpitations, um, you can reach for a better blocker, but it's something that we don't use too often. But as you can imagine, if you think there's a sympathetic overlie, then better blockers can be helpful. As mentioned, the compression stockings are great for venous pooling. And if symptoms persist, persist then we'll be looking at other strategies to try and improve things. Other treatments we're looking at in our patients with long COVID, especially with those with cardiovascular disease, is to try and get them to lose weight. We know that being obese is pro-inflammatory and um, increases vascular dysfunction. We also try, and if we can, get them into pulmonary rehabilitation classes. If their predominant problem is breathlessness following their um, infection, alternative therapies such as acupuncture, um, stretching maneuvers have also been shown to help. I think we're also seeing a large proportion of patients who have a large um, kind of a mental side to their illness and I think going back to work too early is really detrimental. And in those patients who haven't fully recovered, then a graded return to uh, work and exercise is important. And again, as mentioned for POTS, I think the most simple thing I've found is to acknowledge that these patients actually have true symptoms and that often goes a long way to help improving them. My last couple of slides is just about um, vaccinations. The mRNA vaccine continues to be an extremely massive part of our referral base. We are, we are still seeing many patients with ongoing cardiovascular symptoms post their mRNA vaccines. And for patients under mandates, this is still a huge issue. 
Again, validation that their symptoms are real is very important. We're seeing a lot of chest pain, palpitations, dyspnea, and what the theory is, and I'm probably going to get told off by Miriam, um, is it seems to be an immune reaction to the spike protein of the mRNA vaccine. Um, Vaccine-related myocarditis is very rare. Um, it's usually mild. And in this current juncture, the real question when you have your patients is balancing the risk of Omicron to not just themselves, but to their household members, their sick parents, their immunocompromised children, versus the risk of further mRNA vaccine. And the answer to that is not clear. If in doubt, um, managing your patient with symptoms post-vaccine, I encourage ECG. I know that's hard. I, pro I promise I won't bang on about that. But a simple troponin CRP measurement can often give you the information, as well as a good history to try and tease out whether or not they've got myocarditis or pericarditis. And just on a side note, I think the Ministry of Health is about to come out and say that if anyone's had previous myocarditis or pericarditis, then no, they're no longer um, required to have a further mRNA vaccine if under a mandate. So I guess for a cardiologist, we're not sure if COVID's going to bring a ripple or a tidal wave of problems. Um, but what we do know is that unfortunately, it looks like COVID is going to alter the long-term trajectory of patients with chronic cardiac diseases. And unfortunately, this is the very subgroup who are most at risk for severe outcomes from their COVID infection. So an unfortunate meeting of pathologies. Thanks very much. So thank you, Tom. So if you're seeing a tsunami, obviously the uh, primary care is seeing a bit of a tsunami out there anyway. Nice bit of advice there you gave us. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Gary McAuliffe. He's the Medical Director of Pathology and Laboratory Services, Auckland DHB. And he's going to talk about um, COVID uh, serology, clarity or confusion. Over to you, Gary. Um, I thought I'd start the um, talk by saying that, sorry, there isn't much help that I can give you for diagnosis of long COVID. And it's been interesting looking at the Q's and A's. Um, the focus has been really on what constellation of symptoms um, are consistent with long COVID? How do I get a diagnosis? And, and some of the other panelists have been answering the question that you don't need a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19 in order to progress down a, a pathway. And, and that's good because that's consistent with the un, unfortunate um, situation that we're in, which is that COVID-19 serology isn't a funded test in the community. So it's not available generally in primary care. There is some commercial uh, availability particularly in the realms of pre-departure testing, but it's not a test that is generally available for you to request. Now, the other main factor in, in my response there is that in general, respiratory serology is not a useful diagnostic tool. And this is coming from me who had been an early proponent of COVID serology, particularly before we had the Omicron wave um, and for its use in public health investigations, particularly around the border. And there's still certainly ongoing utility for COVID-19 serology in certain situations. And, and um, we have a cohort of patients in hospital who are severely immunosuppressed and we're looking at their immunological response to the virus and whether they're uh, developing virological control and COVID-19 serology is one of the blunt tools that we have for there. Just in general, why respiratory serology isn't a useful diagnostic tool, it's because we can't pinpoint when we've been infected. So we've recently stopped testing for influenza, for mycoplasma, for RSV by serology, and we're severely limiting um, Legionella serology. It's because if you test positive for this by serology, it doesn't mean that that was that happened um, three weeks ago. It could have happened three years ago. And in a clinically relevant time frame, we wouldn't be able to look and see that you've had raised titers for three to five weeks. So that's not a, a great tool for us. What, what I have done is, is had a look at that, the, the literature and seen what is being done overseas in this space. And, what you need for 
diagnosis and getting onto those pathways for long COVID. And I, I was pleased to see that the NICE guidelines from the UK and the ESCMED guidelines from Europe do not unduly focus on gaining a retrospective di diagnosis, particularly the UK where uh, a patient doesn't require a positive or negative uh, COVID test, including antibody in order to go onto that uh, pathway of management. And for the European guideline, there's a focus on a confirmed acute infection rather than trying to gain an, a retrospective diagnosis. So that's good for us. I've got a, a picture here of the virus. And the reason for that is just to explain as I go forward what, what I'm talking about. So that this is the COVID virus. The triangles here are the spike protein, which we all know about because the spike protein is important. That's what the vaccine is directed against. We've got the, the wiggly worm in the middle, which is the RNA. And then we've got the blue spots, which are the nuclear capsid, which is not part of the messenger RNA vaccines that we have. So it's not part of the Pfizer vaccine. In the whole cell inactivated vaccines that um, are used some places overseas in charts set, for example, the Chinese Sinopharm vaccine does in include nuclear capsid because it's all dead stuff. So what, what we would expect is if you've been vaccinated by an mRNA vaccine, you should have anti S antibodies, so anti-spike antibodies. If you've been naturally infected, you would have both anti-S and anti-N, so anti-nuclear capsid, because that's not um, that's part of the, the virus, the response to the virus itself. But um, if you're vaccinated, you would just have anti-S and not anti-N. So that I'll just go through that in this table here, just to explain a little bit better. So if I were to test a patient three to five weeks after their acute COVID-19 infection, then I would expect to see anti-S and anti-N antibody detected. If I were to test somebody who'd never been infected but had had Pfizer vaccine, I would expect to see anti-S only. And if somebody had been infected and had vaccination, then I would expect to see probably that they would have both anti-S and anti-N, but if it had been ages ago that they'd been infected, then you can get waning of the anti-N before the anti-S. So that brings us to what can't serology tell you? And it can't tell you whether someone's immune to infection or disease. So there's no magic number there. So I can't say you've got a, You've, you've got an anti-S of 100, and therefore you're not going to get infected, you're not going to end up in hospital, or you're not going to have severe disease and end up in hospital uh, and end up in ICU. And that would be great. There's several reasons for that, but I, I, I don't see that happening quickly. One of the reasons behind this is the impact of variants. So if you look at the Bottom right hand chart here, this is some work that Nikki Moreland has done at the University of Auckland, just across the road from Auckland Hospital. The, the purple dots here are people who have been, who were infected back in March 2020, who have been bled now, and it's seeing how their uh, antibody would, if it's neutralizing against COVID. So each of these lines here, so each block represents one of the variants. So the first one on, on the left here is the ancestral Wuhan virus. So pretty much everybody would still be able to produce neutralizing antibodies to that. The, the, third, uh, the fourth one is Delta. So most people would produce neutralizing antibodies to Delta. If you look at Omicron, none of this cohort of people 300 plus days on from their infection were producing neutralizing antibodies. So they are the people at the top, on the top right, and they're still producing detectable and quite decent values um, on, their, on their antibody that we would measure in the laboratory. So that's one of the reasons why that's not particularly helpful. It doesn't tell you when someone was infected. So just like with flu, if, uh, if you've been asymptomatic, for example, it could have been three weeks, it could have been three months, it could have been two years ago that you were infected, and the value doesn't tell you that. And most importantly, 
if we look at the table here, that we know that we've had 610,315 people infected with COVID, but it's likely double that. And so you're very likely to be seeing someone in front of you in clinic for whatever reason who's been infected with COVID, either symptomatically or asymptomatically. And it doesn't mean that the constellation of symptoms that they've come in with to you with, even if they were to test positive for COVID antibody, are due to that. So that's why I think it's, it's not a disaster. In fact, it's probably quite useful not to think in terms of COVID antibodies when you're talking about diagnosis of somebody who may have missed out on an acute diagnosis of COVID. One of the other questions in the chat was around biomarkers. Now that's a different thing. That's saying this person has got a constellation of symptoms here. Are they due to long COVID? And that I think is still very much at the research stage. Um, I've just, I've seen some preliminary papers on that in nature and, and such places as that. Just to summarize, serology is not available as a funded test in primary care it has limited and reducing utility as a test that's over time so next year um, even now it's it's much less useful than it was last year and it can say if somebody's ever been infected or vaccinated and we can kind of make a a, a division between the two but it can't tell you if there's someone in front of you has long COVID thank you thank you Gary and that's great to have that clarified but that's been a big issue for uh, me and my colleagues. Our next speaker is Dr. Bruce Hamilton, and we've got lots of questions about returning to exercise. Uh, Bruce is the Director of Performance Health, High Performance Sport New Zealand and the New Zealand Olympic Committee. And uh, he's gonna talk about returning to exercise and physical activity, because that's obviously gonna be a big issue for us in primary care. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, kia ora, everyone. Good evening. Um, it is getting late, so I'll try and be quick as I can. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, as and as Bruce sort of mentioned, my role is primarily with the NZOC and high performance sport, and so I do bring a bit of a biased um, perspective in that many of the athletes, but not all, are otherwise um, fit and healthy, um, experiencing COVID, and so. Um, a lot of a lot of our our views come from that. However, hopefully, some of the principles I'll talk to tonight will um, help be helpful, um, can be applied in the general world um, and are scalable in general. So, I think I'd just probably start with the importance of exercise in general. It is um, you know one of our, our massive agents for health, and so prescribing exercise and being comfortable and and competent competent in prescribing exercise and physical activity um, should be. Um, a key part of that and you're absolutely right there's a lot of anxiety around there about returning to exercise after COVID. With specific regard to um, long COVID you know there's been a, um, a real uh, concern for athletes and elite athletes in particular and that's where a lot of um, a lot of energy and time has been spent considering COVID in, in the, the literature that we read. Um, and it definitely seems to be affecting different groups in different ways. So, for example, endurance athletes are, are more are more of a concern than uh, team-based athletes. And so there's, there's a bit of a differential appearing there. Um, with specific regard to returning to exercise post-COVID, and I'm going to be talking about COVID generally returning after COVID, not after um, long COVID or other complications. When you look at the evidence out there, um, there isn't a hell of a lot of evidence there. So a lot of what we base stuff on at the moment is still expert opinion. Um, a lot of it's come out of the UK and it's really variable in its approach. So depending who's written it, what specialty they come from and what their interest is, um, there's a, a range from being extreme, extremely conservative in returning to exercise um, to quite cavalier in terms of returning people to exercise. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is is our New Zealand um, sort of middle of the road approach that we've tried to take um, in terms of uh, returning our athletes uh, to, to sport. Um, I guess the, the final comment on that is that it's, it's really based on evidence from early um, in the pandemic. So um, at best it's around Delta, certainly there's no evidence around returning to athletes in the Omicron state at the moment. I saw a couple of questions in the in the chat um, talking about returning to work and physical activity. I think certainly that's not what I've focused on in terms of my talk content, but I think the principles should be translatable um, pretty simply. 
So what are the overarching principles that we're applying when we're looking at returning people to exercise? Well, I think as a lot of the speakers have said tonight, individualizing the approach is critical when we're dealing with um, COVID, understanding their medical history and their risk factors um, for um, ongoing issues. And in the context that we work in, it's um, individuals that have had a history of uh, energy availability issues, um, uh, previous fatigue related issues and underlying um, chronic health conditions such as diabetes and, and um, asthma and the like. So understanding the individual's medical history is critical. Understanding their training and activity history, if we're going to be prescribing exercise and returning people to exercise is critical, knowing what they're actually looking to return to and what they've done before in relation to, ex uh, in relation to sport and exercise and, and, uh, and physical activity will be key. And then understanding the specifics around their particular COVID-19 history and assessment is critical. So putting some uh, understanding where they are at in relation to their, to their COVID infection and um, understanding the severity and, and all complications that they may have experienced already um, when considering uh, prescribing exercise will be key. The second overarching principle that we, we apply is to be cautious. So we um, certainly do not yet fully understand the consequences of COVID. We don't understand all of the implications of over-exercising or exercising too intensely or too much volume at this stage. And so we are certainly advocating for a cautious approach when um, graduating people into exercise. And the third principle is that it's um, progressive, graduated and monitored. Um, First part of that progression should be education, making sure that all the <clears throat> individuals are, are fully informed and understand enough about um, what the potential issues with um, returning to exercise too quickly or too slowly might be in relation to their COVID. Um, not setting timelines spe specifically on the return to activity is important. So while everybody is after when can I be back playing hockey or doing my sport, um, it's important to recognise that the timelines that an individual will have will be based on their response. And so monitoring people for relevant symptoms, such as, you know, the symptoms of myocarditis, myocarditis and the like, which has been um, so well covered already, is a really important part of it. And any symptoms will obviously change the progression that people will be going through. The three tools that we have when we're prescribing exercise really is the duration, the frequency and the intensity. And so those are the variables that you can you know, uh, muck around with when you're sort of prescribing an individual's return to activity that they want to be doing. I guess my final part of that um, progression graduated and monitored component is that uh, the mental health of individuals all the way through this is really important. And certainly in the field that we work in, mental health around COVID has been a massive issue. Um, it's really exposed some, um, some challenges for a lot of individuals and, um, and Returning to exercise can both be a positive and a negative in regard to their mental health. So, um, so it's certainly something to be keeping front of mind as you're working through um, returning individuals to exercise. Um, the issues that we're concerned about when prescribing exercise obviously is that we're exacerbating an illness or we're prolonging an illness, we're predisposing someone to long COVID, we're um, uh, not recognising an underlying or a developing myocarditis in athletes exercising or individuals exercising through symptoms that uh, may be of concern, other systems and complications that may be there, and um, and obviously if we if we go and do the exercise if we set up an exercise program that actually has a negative effect, then actually the consequences can be quite significant in terms of life returning to work and exit and uh, and ongoing exercise down the line. So taking a cautious approach, doing it slowly. Um, and keeping uh, and monitoring individuals closely is really key to making sure that we're not making it worse for athletes, for individuals as they return. And obviously, depending on someone's, um, how long they've been out with COVID, the detraining effect is, is massive. And certainly in the athletes that we deal with, um, you know, the mind is still saying that you can do what you were doing six weeks ago, but the body has changed quite significantly. And so um, the risk of injury after a detraining period and certainly after a significant illness is um, quite high. And so that's got to be built into your um, return to, to training and returning to activity um, plan. So I've just outlined very briefly here the sort of the, the process that we would go through and it, it is pretty high level and, um, and it's just a guide. I certainly wouldn't um, live and die by this because as I say, it's not based on um, on a huge amount of empirical evidence. So 
obviously during the act of infection, um, recommendation is, is resting and managing the infection as appropriate. Um, we don't put a timeline on that. Um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of the patients and athletes that we're seeing at the moment are using the well. I'm isolating for seven days, so that's my time that that I'm uh, that, that this is an issue for, and so I can start doing stuff or do stuff uh, after that, even though if I'm still symptomatic. Um, we certainly don't return people into activity when they've got significant symptoms. As people are recovering, um, the key for us is making sure that they're able to perform activities of daily living. Um, and we sort of look at that for a three to five day period. And we, again, a three to five day period is a, is a, is a broad generalization, but it just gives some indication and, and it may be longer for those with um, more comorbidities and, and issues moving forward. Um, and we would anticipate during that time that people would be able to walk 500 metres without significant shortness of breath, um, walking up and down stairs without major issues prior to proceeding to the next stage, which is predominantly around cardiovascular exercise. So this is you know, generally walking, stationary bike, ergometer, um, aiming to keep the heart rate you know, 70% of maximum and less than 30 minutes per day. And again, really key to be monitoring for symptoms, respiratory symptoms and cardiovascular symptoms predominantly, but also for any other symptoms that may be suggesting that actually this individual is not responding well to the training load that's been given to them. And, you know, for a 50-year-old um, coming back um, after a COVID infection, 70% of heart rates, you know, around 115, 120. Um, so it's a pretty low-level exercise. And again, that's for that three- to five-day period. After that, and given that there's been no symptoms, we would typically progress someone to a little bit more cardiovascular exercise, so increasing the maximum heart rate and increasing the duration of that exercise. And we'd add, add in some body weight type strengthening exercise, some movement pattern stuff to try and get people moving a little bit more and readying them for whatever nature of exercise they actually want to be doing when they're returning to proper activity. And then we sort of uh, enter the normal activity stage where we're still keeping the intensity down below 80%. Individuals might be returning to their kayaking, to their um, cycling, um, to their um, you know, whatever activity it is and, and team-based activities that people may want to be doing, but still keeping an eye on um, the intensity and keeping it down below two hours um, per day, which for most people um, in um, our environments shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, and again, increasing the body weight strengthening type exercise at that stage and continuing to monitor for symptoms, which is just a, a constant theme through this. And again, that two to five day window. And then as, as people are essentially back into a phase where they're returning to their normal levels, um, we still look at a progressive um, graduated return into their normal activity. So if someone's returning to hockey, we would advise that they you know, for the first few days, they might go and do the warm up and do a little bit of training. Then they gradually progress into more um, full training activities and um, and increasing the frequency of their training. So, one of the elements we haven't talked about here is the frequency. And you know, the rest is resting after exercise is a key aspect of this. And so, progressing people from um, you know one day on, two days off, to two days on, one day off, to one day on, one day off, and making sure that people are getting a recovery is a key part of all the phasing through here. So that's all I've really got to say. Hopefully that gives you some sort of um, principles and guidelines to approach. But as I say, it's got very little evidence base at the moment. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Bruce. You've got the added complication of uh, people champing at the bit to get back to full training, I guess, which uh, that will be a minority of, these, uh, of our patients in primary care. Um, our final speaker um, is Dr. Fred Sundrum. He's Associate Professor in the um, School of uh, uh, Medicine, and uh, he's going to talk about long COVID and mental health. Over to you, Fred. Thank you, Bruce, and thanks for the invitation to speak today. Good evening, all, and perhaps good night for some. Um, yeah, as Bruce introduced, I'm based at two locations, Waitemata DHB and University of Auckland. I'm a general hospital psychiatrist, uh, also known as a liaison psychiatrist. And I think we've managed to cover uh, lots of ground today um, in terms of the various considerations of long COVID and various definitions. And I'll revisit some of those definitions and also perhaps service developments. Just want to declare a couple of uh, conflicts of interest for consideration. So I'm on the advisory board for a couple of organizations, Lundbeck and for Clearhead, which has an artificial chat board. 
and also receive uh, funding from Mind Biotherapeutics for ongoing research. So just coming to some definitions, we've heard that definitions do vary. Um, potentially a definition that most people are familiar with is one from the World Health Organization, whereby the time frame is three months. And we've heard from some of the speakers earlier today that the time frame might start much earlier, possibly for even six weeks of persisting symptoms. And the key thing is there are persisting symptoms and often a whole cluster of symptoms, um, headaches, chest pain, shortness of breath, muscle aches, malaise, uh, brain fog or cognitive dysfunction. And this, this is a serious, serious problem, the cognitive dysfunction. How common is it? Um, a good chunk of it, and this is probably an underestimation of uh, people uh, with a COVID who actually developed long COVID um, and potentially much higher in those who are hospitalized. In terms of potential groups that might be affected, generally vulnerable groups are people from socioeconomically deprived backgrounds, people with pre-existing illnesses, potentially ethnic minorities, and uh, a middle age or perhaps slightly under middle age sort of age group. And with, uh, with regards to psychiatry, I mean, often we consider a person holistically um, and a lot of the impacts are not just in the physical health domain. And when you consider the well-being domain, quite, quite a lot of impacts in terms of how, how somebody perceives their general well-being in terms of quality of life, satisfaction or happiness, work and income being significantly impacted in up to half, um, that, that's, that's major. And for those people who are hospitalized, the symptoms can be a lot more uh, disabling, a lot more persistent and potentially more, more severe when it persists. Some common other symptoms are fatigue, sleep difficulties, and once again, that brain dysfunction or cognitive dysfunction. Um, at, at this stage, I'd like to perhaps delineate mental health and break it down into perhaps psychiatric impacts and psychological impacts. The, the term mental health tends to be a very wide umbrella where lots of things can potentially fit under this umbrella. So perhaps if you look at the psychiatric impacts first, um, the psychiatric impacts are taught not to be due to the direct effects of the virus. Like we heard about the myocarditis and direct effects on cardiac tissue. With uh, long COVID and the psychiatric impacts are thought to be secondary to, to life events, to stresses, to relationships, to finances, very real world difficulties, real world challenges. And also when somebody has persistent symptoms, and I, I'm sure most people are aware of the mind-body connection whereby both can affect each other. In terms of uh, numbers, uh, anxiety and depression, extremely common. This was from a recent study published in Lancet. And, and a really emerging area is the, the concept of traumas and post-traumatic stress disorder uh, for people who are survivors or trauma survivors with, with COVID. For example, people have ended up going to ICU, having a long stay in hospital and ongoing recovery post-discharge. And the rates of mental illness are, are similar to people who experience trauma and who are considered trauma survivors. Um, I think another big consideration are those folks who have pre-existing mental illness and how COVID impacts or long COVID can exacerbate pre-existing illness, whether it's depression, anxiety, addictions, psychosis, eating disorders, a whole variety of pre-existing disorders can be worsened. And looking at the psychological impacts, and I'll, what I'll consider under the psychology umbrella are the emotions, the behaviors, the cognitions, the social impacts, and, and the mind. And loneliness is a common theme that, that arises whether in the acute phase of COVID in terms of uh, needing to self-isolate, uh, physical distancing from others. And this can sometimes persist uh, even after the acute phase. And um, in terms of traumas, this, this is a very real experience for those perhaps with the severe end of COVID, actually being in hospital or being in ICU themselves or witnessing family members who are going through that same process in ICU where there's uncertainty, whether they'll pull through or get better or have residual physical health symptoms. 
in terms of the changes at home and at work, th these are real impacts in terms of, for example, somebody being the, the main provider in the household and that being impacted and not able to earn money to support the household and then being dependent on somebody else in the home front. Or if you're a carer, you know, looking after somebody with COVID, that can lead to, to significant burnout. And for example, if they have uh, comorbidity, so COVID or long COVID with diabetes or an autoimmune condition and needing care uh, by someone else. There's also the consideration of stigma of testing positive. Uh, this is in the acute phase, but also after recovery from the acute phase with long COVID and not making a full recovery and perhaps not being taken seriously by peers, colleagues, sometimes by clinicians, you know, in the medical profession too. And sometimes there's this concept of traumas and survivor guilt, you know, that you've actually survived when many others have had COVID and didn't pull through. Another significant impact uh, you might have heard about in the last two years are missing significant family events, missing weddings, christenings, going to funerals, and having a lot of guilt around missing those key, key events. In terms of, yeah, the medical system and messages they might get from the medical system, one of the key challenges is this perception that they're not taken seriously. And whether that's, that's the message that is delivered or the message that's, that's received, um, you know, there's consideration of people not being taken seriously or the symptoms not being considered genuine. We've heard lots about possible mechanisms of COVID, so I'm not gonna touch on this for, for too long, but just to be aware of related conditions uh, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, post-viral uh, fatigue, and also the, the post-ICU syndrome where people can have very debilitating physical health conditions, spend an extended time in ICU, becoming very physically unwell and developing cognitive dysfunction as a result. And as, as I touched upon earlier, the relationship with psychiatric diseases or illnesses and physical health, it's a real bi-directional relationship. I framed the next part of this uh, talk as GP considerations, but this can apply to, to any clinician. Uh, I framed it as GP considerations because often GPs are the first point of contact in, in primary care. So not focusing on the physical health, um, you know, not just in the breathlessness or the chest pain or the headaches or the recovery from the virus, but often considering the person holistically. So what, what is happening on the social front? What are their real life stresses? How is it impacting on them psychologically? Are they developing depression? Is there a worsening of their addiction? Is there a worsening of the eating disorder? And taking a really broad history, considering all these broad factors is really important uh, for the individual and that their symptoms are being taken seriously, but also it gives you a fuller picture as to what's going on with the individual and their families. And we've heard earlier uh, from a couple of panelists that acknowledging, reassuring, validating the experiences as, as real, that, that's, a, that's a really important consideration for many folks uh, attending services, whether in primary care, specialist services, uh, and, and elsewhere. Important to consider uh, in terms of realistic goals, you know, achievable goals, when do they hope to get back to work? Are there real financial pressures? Do they need support with child care, et cetera? You know, these are real life pressures people have to grapple with and often uh, very stressful when you're compromised in any way physically or psychologically. Another consideration is when to refer to specialist services. This is a bit of a challenge in the New Zealand context. And we've heard from Robin earlier, there are movements at the moment to develop specialist services and getting a sense what these services might look like. It's all currently underway. Um, so it's, it's a space we've got to watch. The, the concept of uncertainty, this is very uncomfortable for many individuals and their families, but also potentially for clinicians when so much is unknown about long COVID, there's still a lot of ongoing research and there's still a lot of uh, things to be clarified. So sometimes this might lead to feelings in the patient and in the clinician of helplessness, unable to support the person, unable to provide good advice, or how quickly they might recover or how long they might be disabled. Hell of a lot of unknowns. 
and how you might consider structuring the assessment process. It covers a lot of ground, a lot of what we've already talked about earlier. Um, and some frameworks you might consider using include using a rehabilitation model rather than a disability model and looking at what the impairments are, but looking at the goals, how to improve function, how do you recover abilities? And also managing somebody with a long-term condition like diabetes, SLE, cystic fibrosis, using a similar sort of framework or approach uh, like that would be very useful. And key things you want to assess are symptoms and symptoms might be physical health, it might be mental health, it might be other aspects. And getting a sense of the impairments and the impacts uh, on the individual and the families. And getting a sense of resources and resources here relates to uh, what is available in your own service, whether in primary care or specialist services, but also getting a broader understanding of community care resources, peer support groups, uh, self-help groups, digital uh, approaches. There's a lot of possible approaches out there and just being aware of it is an important consideration. And escalating to specialist care when appropriate. And as, as we've talked earlier, the degree of specialist services and access is still a developing space. Hopefully it will be clarified later uh, as time goes on. Some management considerations. Uh, we've heard lots about this in terms of uh, management plans being tailored or individualized and managing associated symptoms. And once again, considering an integrated approach where lots of disciplines are working together rather than it, uh, working in silos and considering a rehab framework, multidisciplinary approach and a really useful model to think about is the chronic pain space where there's often that integrated way of working, multidisciplinary where lots of uh, different disciplines are working together. In terms of psychological treatments, there are specific psychological treatments. Uh, I'll just touch upon them very briefly. This involves actually recruiting psychologists. And we know that the mental health sector is lacking, um, you know, hell of a lot of psychologists. Things like sleep hygiene, activity diaries, goal setting, important for, for cognition and for those people struggling with uncertainties or their illness. I'm just going to end here with the international service developments. In New Zealand, this is still a developing space, but digital health is something that's developed actually quite nicely in the last two years in terms of telehealth, uh, phone lines and support networks and apps, things like Mentimia, uh, Clearhead, Habits that have come on stream. And looking at the international space, I think Robin has covered this really well, whereby you know the, the models in the UK, in Italy and Canada have been explored, but often primary care is the first point of contact. And a broad consideration is whether you utilize existing services and tag on to that or develop new bespoke services. Telehealth, dig digital space, really important. And psychology, really, really important to recruit more psychologists overall in healthcare system. And research, a hell of a lot of money is being invested in the US, for example, 1.15 billion in the long COVID research space and particularly focusing on neurological and mental health. Okay, I'll end there. Great, thanks, Fred. Um, I've just got one question that's been coming through on the YouTube channel. It's probably for you and for Bruce, um, is about exercising people with chronic fatigue syndrome, given that there seems to be you know, some concern that may make people worse. Any suggestions from you two about how to handle that? Fred, do you have anything? Yeah, I might just touch upon briefly on this. Um, I mean, chronic fatigue syndrome, there, there seems to be a clear definition of what chronic fatigue syndrome is, as opposed to fatigue that you might experience post-COVID. I think with chronic fatigue syndrome, there's certainly a body of literature about graded exercise and having goals and CBT, but there's also additional literature in terms of uh, looking at the person holistically. So diet, weight, healthy eating, um, and, and other aspects that goes beyond just the exercise aspects or, or the CBT. So looking at things more broadly is going to be really important. Um, and from my side, yeah, I wouldn't have a lot to add over and above what Fred has said. Um, I think exercise and the chronic fatigue um, individuals, exercise can play a role in the rehabilitation, but it can also be a burden if it's um, being overdone. So I think managing that is, is, uh, is key. Yep. Okay. Well, what I might do is bring things to the close because it's been a very long night.
and just uh, thank the speakers for giving up their time. Thank the audience for giving up their time. I think it's been a fabulous night. Uh, we've had an incredible range of speakers. Um, Stuart, any final words from you? Just to, to again, thank the speakers for, for bringing together, I think it's been an excellent presentation around mm. um, some of the, the pitfalls we've got ahead of us with long COVID, um, but some really useful information on getting people back post the viral um, phase of it. I think that's going to be very much welcomed by GPs, so thank you. And I think we've got most of the questions that can be answered, answered. So I think I'll call it quits here, guys. We will look forward to seeing you at more Goodfellow webinars. Thank you very much. Good night.